Modern elections are said to be in their hands more than half the electorate, women voters. They're the inside story. Hello, I'm Ray Suarez. As this election day, as any election day approaches, experts slice and dice the voting population, trying to figure out where different voters are going, why, and who gets the advantage. One of the biggest gaps between Republicans and Democrats came from one of the biggest collections of voters in the population, women. In the last presidential race, married women voted for Mitt Romney, single women for President Obama. Education, wages, social mobility, student debt, they all land on American men and women in different ways, which might explain why they vote differently. But is being female really what a sociologist might call their master status? Are women, black or white, rural or urban, homeowners or renters, all those other things when they walk into the voting booth too, just as much as women? Now men, I don't want you to feel neglected. I like men just fine. <laughs> President Barack Obama in Rhode Island Friday was on a mission to woo the women. And the idea that my daughters wouldn't have the same opportunities as somebody's sons, well, that's unacceptable. That's not acceptable. With the midterms quickly approaching, winning over women voters is becoming the focus for both parties. At Friday's rally, Obama praised women for their endurance through the slowly recovery. Economy. So while many women are working hard to support themselves and their families, they're still facing unfair choices, outdated workplace policies. That holds them back, but it also holds all of us back. In 2012, a majority of American women voted for the president. Though Mitt Romney won more married women's votes in 2012, the single women's vote is larger, giving Democrats a boost they needed to win. But a recent Gallup tracking poll says women's approval of the president is now essentially split right down the middle. And single women don't typically vote in midterms. Republicans are seizing on that window of opportunity. What's the difference between me and Mark Udall on contraception? I believe the pill ought to be available over the counter. On average, women working for Senator Begich make $23,000 less than men. On the stump in Iowa, in one of the toughest Senate contests of the term, is Joni Ernst, who would be the first woman ever to represent Iowa in Congress. Thank you so much. How are you? God bless you. She calls herself a proud Iowan, a mother, a farm girl, but she says she's not running on her gender and not counting on women to propel her to office. This midterm, the economy is the top issue on women voters' minds. Though the U.S.'s gross domestic product is climbing, wages since the Great Recession have stagnated. And women are feeling it more than men. On average, women working full-time make 22% less than their male counterparts, according to the 2013 census. That's about 78 cents to every dollar for a man. Fewer women than men were unemployed last year, but only 74% of women worked full-time, as opposed to 87% of men. Like any voters, women carry their life circumstances with them into the polling booth. Both parties are making the argument that works in their favor. Women and the midterm election this time on the program. If the voting preferences of women weren't such an interesting marker as we dissect elections and campaigns, candidates wouldn't be asking the same question famously put by Sigmund Freud. What does a woman want? Joining me for that conversation, Marcy Stetch is the National Press Secretary for EMILY's List, which supports pro-choice women for public office. Hadley Heath Manning is a policy analyst at the Independent Women's Forum, which seeks to improve women's lives through free markets and personal liberty. And Bill Schneider is a distinguished senior fellow at the organization Third Way. Marcy Stetch, let me start with you. What are the top priorities? When public opinion researchers go out into the country and say to women, what are you voting about? What do they tell them? Uh, well, women, it, 2014 is all about women. It's about women candidates, women voters, and the issues that matter to women and families. 
And what we know through our research and through what we see happening on the campaign trail is that it all boils down to economic security for women. Um, that means economic security for women in the form of raising the minimum wage, ending gender discrimination in pay, ending the gender wage gap that you referenced in your opening piece, um, but also full access to health care. So that means access to contraception, full access to health care for women and their families. Um, you know, right now it's been a little bit of a volatile news cycle. We've had lots of different um, topics coming up. People worried about economic, national security, economic security has through and through been the number one issue that women are clearly uh, going to decide on Tuesday what makes them go to the polls. Um, you know, at Emily's List, we do a lot of this research, and it's also not only motivating to women, it's motivating to many men voters, drop-off voters in 2014 when they hear about what's at stake in these elections. Hadley Heath Manning, how that same question, when you talk to your members about what they vote on, what do they tell you? I think it's clear, I'll agree with Marcy, that the economy is the number one issue across the board. That's true for both women and men. Also, the way our federal government works. In a recent Gallup poll, that was the second most important issue. So there are some concerns among women and men that our administration isn't showing the competency dealing with some very complicated issues, whether it's uh, threats of terrorist organizations or public health outbreaks. Uh, we see that you know security is an issue, not just economically speaking, but across the board, national security also. And then also of high importance is jobs and job creation. All of these issues come in among the front runners. Bill Schneider, in the craft, in the way we do politics right. in this country, is it even rational to look at women as a discrete block of voters? They are so many different kinds of Americans in so many different places and circumstances. Is there a, a set of issues? Are there questions that you could ask them that would actually unite them around interests? Well, women uh, have tended to support Democrats ever since Ronald Reagan became president in 1981. Uh, and the reason is that uh, the Democrats uh, have made an issue of protecting the safety net. Women are inclined to favor a strong safety net more than men. Men are more likely to be risk takers. The evidence for that, by the way, is that 90 percent of people in prison are men because they're risk takers. Women don't, aren't stupid. They don't take foolish risks. And the result is women, like other constituencies that uh, value the safety net, the government safety net, tend to be inclined to vote Democratic. The same is true of poor people, minorities, labor union members. Uh, women want the government to be there because they don't feel as economically secure as men do. Hadley Heath Manning, is that just a different way of saying what you just said? That uh, when they talk about the government, they want it to work and do what it's meant to do with the money it's given to spend? I would agree with Bill that women are more likely to support social safety nets, but I think what we've seen over the past several years is a departure from the definition of a social safety net as being there uh, mainly for the indigent poor, for people who are, who are incapable of caring for themselves, using the rhetoric about social safety nets to apply to other economic policies that may not actually have to do with caring for the poor, but are, um, you know, code words or Trojan horses for economic redistribution, uh, which is a different kind of economic policy separate from creating a social safety net and strengthening the safety net for those who need it most. And that's why I believe more women are becoming skeptical of a very liberal economic agenda and their votes are now up for grabs. Can you give me an example, Hadley, of something that is sort of that um, social Trojan horse that uh, is a, becomes a long-term kind of dependency rather than a safety net? Well, I think one of the biggest issues we see in, in polling continues to be health reform. And health reform is impacting women and men as individuals and families in very different ways across the country. It's a very complicated issue. But many women are, are feeling that they've gotten the short end of the stick when it comes to Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act because despite some of the promises it made to women and some of the benefits that the administration touts that this legislation has for women, there's also a downside. Some women in their families are seeing higher costs. 
Some women and their families might have experienced a health insurance policy cancellation or had a relationship with a doctor interrupted because of that insurance change. And so that creates some instability in women's lives. And I think they recognize that this kind of new social program may not be as much about helping the poor as they thought or helping people with pre-existing conditions, but instead is an entire restructuring of our insurance industry. Marcy Stetch, when you say safety net, uh, do we have to be talking about all the same things? Is the, Affor the Affordable Care Act in there or something else? Absolutely. Access to health care is an incredibly important issue for women and families across the, co the country. Um, and what I think is interesting when we talk about women and access to health care, um, we look at something like, for example, access to contraception, which is something that has been a political issue over the past election cycle because we've seen Republicans time and time again trying to defund Planned Parenthood, roll back the clock on their rights and freedoms through repealing the Affordable Care Act. Um, you know, birth control is a social issue only if you've never had to pay for it. Um, and women in this country know that saving uh, that money in their pocketbooks through having full access to contraception through the Affordable Care Act is something that is beneficial to themselves and their families. So yes, we talk about um, the, the entire host of issues when it comes to um, access to health care, but it's not only that, it's access to health care for their families. Um, women are becoming more and more the majority of the breadwinners in their families. Um, so these are the issues that really matter to them and that's why they're looking at Republicans versus Democrats. D Democrats are 100% clear where they stand on this issue. Republicans want to roll back the clock. And that is the contrast that voters, women voters, are facing as they go into Tuesday. Bill Schneider, roll back the clock or otherwise <laughs> some Republican candidates have been very careful just not to go there. Are they reading polls that ask women about things like access to contraception? Well, they're, what they're trying to do is steer the election away from those kind of social security issues and more towards the administration. I think Hadley was exactly right when she said that for most women and for most voters, the issue is the competence of this administration. The issue is President Obama. Every day, if you follow this election, you're reading in the newspaper a new story. One story support for the for the Democrats among Latinos is at a low point, just barely a majority, or about 57 percent, but that's down. Support among women is lower than it used to be. Support among young people. There was just a poll from Harvard that showed that a majority of young voters say they want a Republican Congress. When you're seeing women, young people, Latinos, other minorities, support for the Democrats ebbing, it means it's not distinctive to women or to young people. It's something that's happening across the country, and that is a real loss of confidence in this administration. We'll be back with more Inside Story after a short break. In this most recent election, Republican candidates, even ones with long records as social conservatives, have muted their opposition to access to family planning or quieted that emphasis in their campaigns. Is it working to close the gender gap? Stay with us. Welcome back to Inside Story on Al Jazeera America. I'm Ray Suarez. Women's votes, women's clout, this time on the program, as we approach Election Day, is the task changing minds and voting intentions or getting your women out? All campaigns say both, but I want to dig a little deeper into that question. Uh, Hadley Manning, in Colorado, we've seen a Republican candidate who's historically uh, been a, a co-sponsor of a personhood amendment, uh, wanting to bring legal con protection and state interest to a fetus in the womb, uh, support for various programs uh, that have been judged to make access to contraception more difficult. He's chosen during this campaign to de-emphasize that part of his record, not talk about those issues. Is that something that's being done on purpose in part to make the election about something else and not make it about those issues. Well, I would say, you know, I believe the race you're, you're referring to is the Senate race here between Representative Cory Gardner and Mark Udall. And in that race, you know, like so many other races across the country, the issues that voters care most about are still the economy and jobs. But instead, more than half of the advertisements that the Udall campaign has run have been about the contraception issue and specifically about uh, the mandate that Marcy was talking about earlier that um, have 
contraceptive coverage for all FDA approved contraceptives with no copay. And that in particular is what Gardner opposes, but in some ways he got ahead of the issue by coming out in favor of over the counter birth control options. So this sort of creates and, and maybe fosters a discussion we could have about what true access means versus affordability or who pays or some other questions. But yes, I think the Gardner campaign has been largely focused on the issues that voters care more about and therefore the intensity level of voters are going to be on the side of Gardner. And I should also mention that while Gardner has been able to neutralize uh, sort of a gender gap on the female side, Mark Udall is now facing a steep uh, gender gap with men. And so that's going to be maybe a determining factor in this election. Marcy Stetch, a lot of observers have said Mark Udall simply put too many eggs into that issue basket. What do you make of that? Well, I'll go back to what we were talking about before, which is that access to health care is an economic issue for women and families. And I see that happening in Colorado. I mean, if you look at any of these polls right now, women overwhelmingly support Senator Udall because they trust him more than they trust he, they trust Cory Gardner on these issues. Um, you know, Cory Gardner did a, a really interesting move here. He was one of the first Republicans to come out in favor of over-the-counter birth control. Um, and I think that this is a sign that Republicans knew that they were so far in trouble with, Republic, with women overall that they had to offer something. Um, but this happening in an election year just a couple of months out, I just think it really shows just how they want to cherry pick something that sounds good, but the actual policy implications of over-the-counter birth control and simply fo focusing on that alone puts the cost the burden of cost back on women and families. So it may make a nice talking point for Cory Gardner, but in the end, women voters are going to see right through that. And I was looking, furthermore, I was looking at some of the numbers in Colorado. There is it's extreme enthusiasm for Democrats right now, but 77% of people who say they're going to, to vote for, for uh, Mark Udall said because he's on the right side of women and families. These are women and family issues in Colorado. That's why he's getting their support right now. But when wasn't there a risk of being outflanked? Wasn't there a risk of having that issue neutralized when the candidate for the other party says, no, no, I'm not against these things. I want access and I want it. In fact, no more prescription, no more difficulty at the medicine counter in the pharmacy. I want women to be able to get this. And that just takes it away as an issue. Well, I think that we'd want the experts to be the ones to make the call. They're not politicians, as Cory Gardner is trying to make right now. Experts in this field believe that if we want to have an, an entire conversation about access to health care and access to contraception for women, it shouldn't just be focusing on one little piece of it, which is this over-the-counter. Yes, of course we'd like to expand access to health care, to contraception for women, um, but it needs to be done in a holistic fashion. And repealing the Affordable Care Act is not going to be productive for women and families, and that's what Cory Gardner, Gardner stands for. He also stands for a personhood amendment, which would actually ban certain types of birth control. Um, he's trying to wriggle away from what his record is, um, but women deserve answers, and that's why they continue to support Senator Udall. You know, Bill, the Affordable Care Act is a fairly complex mm -hmm. and broad right. bill, but this is one aspect of it that yes. falls more heavily on women than on men. Uh, unique among that. I mean, if you're yeah. going to do heart disease or lung disease, yes. both men and women have hearts and lungs, but only women have wombs. Uh, has this sort of obscured the debate over Affordable Care Act, yes or no? Affordable Care Act working or Yeah, well, it's, what's interesting is Republicans are not doing what we expected them to do. They're not running on repeal the Obamacare, repeal the Affordable Care Act. If asked, they will say they favor repeal, but they're not trying to make a big issue of it. And Democrats like uh, Udall are, seem to be facing something of a backlash if they insist on talking about issues which to many voters is distracting from the real problem in this election, which is where are the jobs? We want economic security. Uh, and the Republicans are trying to counter their vulnerabilities by saying we're not going to do anything terribly radical on health care and anything else. There will be more Inside Story after this short break. Women are earning more four-year degrees than men. The entering classes in professional schools are now slightly more female after being overwhelmingly male throughout American history. Will changes inside American society and the economy heighten or dampen the differences in the way women and men see the country and their place in it? Stay with us.
You're watching Inside Story on Al Jazeera America. I'm Ray Suarez. Though there are more women than men and more women voters than men, the lopsided majority of state legislators, governors, mayors, and members of Congress are men. As women continue their steady gains in school and the workplace, will more women run for office? Still with us, Marcy Stetch is the National Press Secretary for EMILY's List. Hadley Heath Manning is a policy analyst at the Independent Women's Forum. And Bill Schneider is a distinguished senior fellow at the organization Third Way. And Bill, we've been covering politics long enough to have lived through several Year of the Women's or yes. Years of the Women. Yes. Uh, if they go at this rate, I think it'll be like 2250 before it's 5050. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we want to wait till it's 2250, till it's 5050. What brings women off the sideline to run? Are men more willing to vote for women than they were? years ago. I think the answer is yes. That could be tested in the next presidential election. We don't know. And there are plenty of women, more women now running for Senate and House uh, than there ever were in the past. You've got to get women to want to do those things. They have to want to run for office. You have to recruit them. They have to feel confident about running for office. And more of them do, particularly as they're gaining status and money and power in the workplace. We've seen a real change in this country. More and more breadwinners in families are now women. I mean, there was a Pew poll recently that showed that uh, the number of women breadwinners who earn more income than men do in families has been growing. And for those women, economic inequality, the pay gap, those things make a lot of difference. Hadley Heath Manning, uh, this year brings us a lot of Republican women candidates. Is, is there a nice spread in who's getting attention among women campaign, women's campaigning for higher office? I believe so. I believe that there's a lot of formidable candidates, um, men and women, on both sides of the aisle in this year's election. I would caution, though, against a, a policy goal or against a cultural, uh, societal goal of having each profession represented by 50% men and 50% women. That kind of measurement of outcomes or that kind of parity isn't necessarily indicative of the different choices and different preferences that men and women make. So we also have to remember that men and women together, that our interests are tied and that uh, regardless of our sex, we can want and work for what's best for our country. So I don't feel as a woman that I'm necessarily better represented by uh, someone in, in government who shares my same sex. Men can also represent the interests of women, uh, and many have done so in their time in office. So I would encourage more women to run for office if that's their desire, um, but I would caution too much because there are some professions that are more heavily skewed towards women, and we don't necessarily see the push to get men into those professions. Well, in some countries, they do it by legal requirement, and I don't think anybody's okay. suggesting that for the United States. Right. But Emily's List, certainly its roots are in mm -hmm. trying to raise money for female candidates. After all, early money is like yeast. <laughs> uh, have you been able to narrow some of that gap? Are women able to access some of those pots of cash that sit around the country waiting uh, in the wallets of political activists. That's right. Well, Emily's List, we've been at this for 29 years. When we first started in 1985, there had not been a Democratic woman senator elected to the United States Senate in her own right until Barbara Mikulski. Um, and Emily's List recognized at that time that we needed to have an organization that was really fighting to get women into the process. Um, they weren't seen as viable candidates until Emily's List came along and started investing in our women candidates and building a network. Now, that network is over 3 million nationwide that we have at Emily's List. We've helped elect 10 governors, 19 United States senators, over 60 women to the United States House over 500 to the state and local level. So we've really been able to build a pipeline of women. And if you think about it, it's not just the idea of having a woman at the table. I mean, this is really about bringing a woman's perspective. When we have so many important issues facing our country that impact women and families, access to health care, raising the minimum wage, education, I mean, it could go on. This, these are all incredibly important issues for women, and having a woman's voice at that table is critical. Um, it's been an incredibly difficult in political climate in Washington, D.C. I don't think anyone would argue with that. Um, but if you look at the last year alone, what's been done in the United States Senate, whether it's uh, tackling issues like military sexual assault, which was Senator Gillibrand, 
if you look at Patty Murray passing the first budget in four years. Um, we've seen women being able to get things done in the United States Senate that hadn't been able to have get done before. Um, we need more women, and that's what the opportunity is this week. Bill, you got about a half a minute. Uh, this may be, women may be the solution to what people see as the biggest problem in government, gridlock. That's because men are highly combative. They want to fight. Women are, tend to be more reasonable. Uh, and a lot of voters will see women candidates in office as people who are able to get things done, where men who achieve public office, all they want to do is fight with each other. But if we look at the way the Senate works, are the conciliators, are the people who are looking for that bridge more likely to be women? A la yes. Susan Collins, Olympia Snow, and so on. Uh, generally speaking, yes, there are always going to be women at the extremes, but I think on the whole, women tend to be more rational and reasonable about these matters. Bill Schneider, Hadley Heath Manning, Marcy Stetch, thank you all. That brings us to the end of this edition of Inside Story. Thanks for being with us. Join us next time in Washington. I'm Ray Suarez.